this podcast is brought to you by Midwinter. These guys were a startup, an entrepreneurial startup some 10 years ago, way before it was even cool to be a tech startup, and have since then gone on to win every single award year after year after year when it comes to financial advice software. I use them, um, I know a lot of people that have, and if you haven't already jumped onto the new way of doing business, which is all cloud-based and API, so it all talks to each other, then go look at yourself in the mirror and sort yourself out and go get Midwinter. Thanks everyone for jumping on board. Um, and just to let you know, Brett, we're recording this. Um, so just want to introduce Brett Evans from Atlas Wealth Management. Um, so Brett, the reason we've got him on is because he does lots of work with expats and he's very niched in the way he runs his business. So uh, we want to get him on, just have a chat to him about how he runs that business and, and uh, what he's kind of learned and what mistakes he's done throughout the business. So Brett, over to you. Uh, what's your business? Uh, how long have you been running it for? Thanks, Phil. Um, Atlas, as of the 1st of September, will be five years old. So uh, we're still pretty young, uh, learning a lot. Um, my background, I've got one of those really weird sort of backgrounds. Uh, born in Newcastle, uh, New South Wales. Uh, moved to Tucson, Arizona at six months of age. Uh, Dad was in the Air Force. Uh, typical RAF brat, moved around a lot. Uh, then joined up with uh, Cathay Pacific. So lived in Hong Kong for most of my teen years and, and uh, younger years. And um, then decided to come back to obviously university. Uh, you know, decided to work here. At that point, Hong Kong was going through a lot of change with uh, with the handover from British rule to Chinese rule. So I thought oh, I'll go to Oz and, and keep doing it. Um, always loved numbers, always loved doing this sort of stuff. So fell into the role with as an analyst with the ASX, then worked with HSBC, Suncorp, uh, Smith Barney, which became six different names. And, um, and then through the GFC, Working for a city group, or at the time it was City Smith Barney, um, it became a bit of a liability. Uh, even though clients' holdings are chest sponsored and we all know they're all safe, clients were still getting very nervous. So, probably that's one of the first major lessons I took from managing clients is to listen to the clients. Even though you may know what's right, always listen to the clients. So, in uh, March 2009, myself and a colleague left Citigroup and we got our own AFSL. Um, that was within 16 days of the bottom of the GFC. Mm. So we either thought we're the smartest guys or the dumbest guys, or I'm still trying to work out which is which. So, yeah, and that was a great time because when you step out on your own with your own AFSL coming from a large international corporate like Citigroup, I mean, people reckon they had problems with dealer groups. You should try working for a Citigroup. Um, your thought, your brain almost explodes with options and, and choice and freedom and, and all these sort of things. So that was a great experience because, you know, at that time, I was actually more so a stockbroker than a financial planner. Um, and as you can imagine, being a stockbroker during the GFC wasn't the most pleasant of experiences. Um, you know, sitting there with the screens in front of you, watching the market go down, you know, 5 and 6% in a day is not the most pleasant experience. But another thing that, that experience taught me was get on the front foot and communicate with clients. Clients don't hold you accountable for what the market's doing. Clients hold you accountable for the service they're receiving. So... Every day, I used to get on the phone and call every single one of my clients, regardless of if I spoke to them the day before or, uh, you know, uh, the, the previous day. You know, just get in front of them, hold their hands. Um, the best way I can liken a financial advisor is it's like being a kid when you're in a thunderstorm. You always run to your parent to seek assurance. And that, to me, is the role of advisor. Um, not to crunch the numbers. The computers do that. Everyone knows the process, but the, the clients are coming to you because of you. So these experiences were great experiences. And then probably about 2011, I was getting a bit, you know, disenchanted with the industry thinking, right, I'm 35 now. Where do I see myself going for the next 15 years? And I, I'm not a big fan of business plans because I think they can sometimes constrain you too much. But I sat down and did a, a one page what do, I, what do I want to do in this industry? Yeah. And virtually I wrote down um, who I want to work with because I love the client side. The the technical side, you know, most time bores me, but the, the client side to me is the fun side of it. So I sat down and wrote out a very macro type client I love to work with and then it just jumped off the screen, you know, expats. Mm -hmm. um, because of my background with expats and because – Quite often, I was getting questions from experts overseas by virtue of being an advisor in Australia. Back in those days, 
probably in the 90s to early 2000s, there wasn't a lot of change going on. So, but from about 2010 onwards, there's been so much change in that space that they're now having to seek that advice. Now with data sharing, the ATO is catching up with them. You know, there's all this sort of activity now. So the idea of getting on a plane and going overseas and just sort of setting forgetting is, uh, is no longer. Um, so that's when I sort of sat down and wrote out this one pager and it just jumped at me, you know, uh, it's an expat. So that's when within 30 days, I decided to set up a company, a new company, um, did a deal with my former uh, business partner. He bought me out from the previous company. Yeah. Uh, I, part of the deal was that I could still operate under his AFSL on the premises. So I didn't have to worry about resources and staffing and licensing. Uh, until I got Atlas to a point where, you know, I could go out and get my own AFSL and own office and, and resources that way. So yeah. uh, the government's been kind to us in the sense that they've changed so many things in the last five years that people have had to actually seek out our advice as opposed to me sort of begging them to come this way, yeah, yeah. Um, which has been good. But the, the biggest issue you have with expats is if you want to get access to them, you can't just take out an ad in the age or the Sydney morning Herald or the Courier mail. Yeah. Um, you have to use, be quite inventive in how you communicate with them. And that's where for us, social media has been the, yeah, the, the, the massive part of it. 49% of our clients come from social media. Yeah. Right. So, so just to recap, you left Citigroup in 2009 and yep. you set up a business with your former business partner for two years and then you uh, set up Atlas Wealth. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. So we set up a company called Gamma. Um, we told clients the reason it's called Gamma was because of, you know, Gamma is a financial term. You know, it's the measure of an option's volatility over the underlying security. In actual fact, my colleague, his son, he just had a son called Max and I had a daughter called Gabriella. So we put them together and called it Gamma. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think they like those sort of stories. You know, they sort of, they love that sort of tangible side. Once they, once they get on board, they say, oh, by the way, this is the real story. And they love it. So um, I think it's important to have a story in your business. Mm. Uh, not just the technical side because, you know, they're there to see you because the technical anyway, but they want something else out of that relationship. Yeah. So when you, when you started Atlas Wealth, um, you, are you, are you now self-licensed? Yes, we are. Yep. Yeah. April okay. last year. When, when you first started, you said you, you really looked at uh, expats as what you wanted to do. Did you straight out go, we're only dealing with expats or did you build a business um, through, you know, well, you know, normal clients as you will? and then start working towards expats? It was a bit of a transition period from an old client base to a new client base. Um, one of the reasons that led to me to sitting down and writing that one pager was like a lot of advisors, most of my clients were retirees or soon to be retirees. The GFC knocked them for a six and a lot of them went to TDs and I suddenly realized my business was drying up very quickly. So I realized that I needed to do something. I couldn't just wait for the market to, to improve in order for me to keep growing my business. Yeah. And one of the most conscious efforts I wanted to make was reduce my average age of my clients down. So at the, that stage in 2011, when I was having that chat to myself, my average age was about between 69 and 71 uh, on my client base. And uh, now it's at 45.2. Yeah, right. Okay. That's so a big drop. I'll say again, sorry. That's a big drop. Either some of them died or you, or they're, they're no longer clients. Or a bit well, of look, it is. It's a bit of both. I mean, you know, unfortunately, by virtue of our business, I mean, when you've got an older client base, they all die. Yeah. So unless you're refilling the pipe um, and unless you're refilling with a different type of client, you're always going to get the same result. Yeah, How, that's quite insensitive if your clients to um, die on you, isn't it? Oh, I think it's very selfish. <laughs> all right. So you, you said you wrote down a one-page business plan and that's how you kind of, they jumped out at you niching. Uh, yeah. In terms, of, in terms of your niche, you really wanted expats. Um, yep. So it, do you, for anyone watching who is, who's thinking about, you know, niching into a particular type of client, uh, would you recommend doing the same thing? Write a one-page business page, think yep. about the clients you want to work with? Yeah, look, I mean, I think the first thing is you've got to get enjoyment out of what you do. And the only way you get to get that enjoyment is by working people you enjoy working with. So if you love Excel spreadsheets and real techie, you might want to work with engineers. Um, you might want to work with doctors, miners. I mean, I think it's, it's actually very simple to, to become a specialist. You know, it's just a matter of filling up your intellectual property library with as much information possible. And you've got to live, eat and breathe that area. 
you know, I've got about 18 Google alerts set up um, that anytime there's an article that mentions the word Aussie expert, expert super, you know, there's a whole range of these things I get emailed. So I'm always being fed information that keeps topping up my, my, uh, my knowledge. And then also to one thing I've found, and it's actually unique to this industry, and I think it's awesome. You know, I took my wife down to the IFA Awards uh, the other Friday night, and she's a pharmacist by trade. And she couldn't believe, A, two things, how much information we share amongst each other, mm. and B, uh, how passionate we are for what we do. Because in, in a pharmacy game, they're actually going the other way. You know, they're becoming commoditized. I mean, a pharmacist now is lucky to earn 30 bucks an hour. Yeah. You know, they spend all these years. So, you know, for them, they're a very disenchanted industry. And, you know, that may actually be a, another niche you could go down if, if you had those contacts is to go through and help pharmacists, you know, either transition to becoming a business owner or helping them with their finances because they're actually becoming more and more difficult. So to me, it's actually quite easy and niche. You just got to sit back and think about what you want to do. For me, it was, I want to work with time poor people who were not fee sensitive, uh, who embraced technical and digital media. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just I wrote, there's about 10 things and it was only bullet points. It wasn't even chapter and verse. It's just mm. bullet points. And then when I got to the bottom, the word expat wasn't mentioned, but it jumped off the page. You know, to me that that's, that's the, that's the market that I wanted to work with. You, you did mention technology, which is something that we kind of want to touch on how and what you do um, working with them. But before we do, um, one of the best ways I learn um, is hearing other people's biggest mistakes. Um, so what, are, what is one of the biggest mistakes that you made either in the transition to working with expats uh, or just in, in your business in general? Um, I think the best one was when I, one September 2011, yeah, so Radio Atlas is here. We're the only Australian financial services firm that is designed to work with expats. I'm going to get overseas and just start blasting, you know, and, and just letting people know I'm here. Mm. What I didn't realize, there's a, what they call the offshore IFA market, which anyone who's been overseas at one point or the other has probably been cold called by these guys. And what they are, uh, a sausage factory. And what they want to do is they want to sign you up to insurance link bonds for 10 year savings plans these guys get paid out massive payouts when you sign up and then they move on to the next person. So they promote themselves as financial advisors. So what I was doing, I was getting over there and I was networking and they say, what do you do? And I'd say, I'm a financial advisor. And I couldn't work out why people weren't gravitating to me. They were going the opposite direction. Hmm. So once again, listening, I spoke to another people about it and said, what's, what am I doing wrong here? And then they pointed me out to all these different areas, which, you know, uh, uh, probably the worst thing for our industry offshore, so then I had to reskin that cat and say, right, yo, when I'm networking, what I'm going to say. So people would say, what do you do? I said, oh, I'm up here visiting clients. Oh, okay, who do you look after? I said, oh, I look, I work with Aussie expats. Mm. You know, I look after their financial advice in Australia. So try and differentiate myself to one of those cold calling people because expats get called probably every second week yeah, right. and they get called by a coordinator. They get try and get an appointment set and then it's a lot of sales, 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 sales. So these guys are just, yeah, battle hardened when they hear the word financial advice, their first reaction is run. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just such a subtle difference, isn't it? You're not you're just not using the word financial advice, which they link yeah. to as a, as a negative term. That's it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, and moving on to like how, how do you actually do it? What are the, what type of technologies do you use? Um, and are you still going overseas as often as you as you were at the beginning? Yeah, it sort of, it, it comes and goes. I mean, ideally, I'd like to be overseas more than I normally am. But uh, my last trip was to China in, in June. Um, and the reason for that is right now, you sort of, you work with the resources you've got. And we're trying to, in the process of betting down uh, an advisor that's coming on board out of Singapore. To us, um, we want to have a scalable business. So it's important to get those technical details right, as opposed to me running around the world handing out brochures and trying to sign up clients. So um, we've been doing a lot of focus and attention on our CRM. Uh, I see Naomi's online. So thanks to the guys at Advice OS. Um, you know, to us, that's the only way we're going to get a scalable solution in our business. You know, our grand plan is to have advisors positioned around the world and they're servicing Australian expats in those regional centers. But once again, you need, you know, it's hard to have a guy 5,000 miles away and get him delivering the same advice that you are. 
Mm. So for the last couple of months, we've been really focusing on our tasks, workflows. We build all those things manually um, and making sure that there's a consistent result every time, whether it's myself or Jared or it doesn't matter who it is, people are always doing the same result. So, you know, that to us has been the big focus over the last couple of months. Um, and now that we're out of that, now I can start getting back on the plane and start to go see clients again. But to me, that only serves as a very small part of our reach. Um, you know, I can go and run a seminar with a chamber in China and, uh, you know, we'll get a good response. But, you know, I can post a video on LinkedIn and get 10 times the response. Yeah, right, yeah. So and that's what's taught me. Yeah, it's important to have that presence overseas, yeah. but it's even more important to keep that content coming out. Yeah, so that was a question I had. Is it, do you find it um, difficult to build that relationship with, with your clients being in Australia and then being based overseas? Not necessarily because by and large, most of them are a little bit homesick mm. or they're not homesick, but they miss Oz. So the fact that they get to check, you know, to, to touch base with someone from Australia a lot of the time, um, they love it. Yeah. And they're always seeking advice, not even just on the finance side, but, you know, where should my kids go to school? You know, what's the property market doing? Um, who's a good dentist in Australia? I'm back on holidays. You know, that sort of stuff. And, yeah, yeah. and we find ourselves more of a, a, a pivot when it comes to their decision-making process. And the finance part is our, our portion, but, you know, we're providing referrals to accountants and lawyers and all those sort of guys only because, you know, we've built up that trust with them. Mm. Um, you know, we, we, the, the power of, of technology, especially Skype and any sort of those sort of tools is fantastic. I mean, you know, I was talking to a client in, in Shanghai the other day and she said that she actually talks to me more than she talks to her neighbor. Yeah, right. So, cause it's just a matter of dropping an email. You've got five minutes for a chat, bang up you go, you know, and I can have 20 of those chats in a day and still sit here in the office. Mm. So whether you're servicing clients overseas or domestically, to me, it makes so much more sense to have that conversation that way. I mean, you know, if we've got a client two suburbs away, they can be sitting in their pajamas on a laptop. Yeah. And and just the, um, do you find yourself doing different working hours um, to kind of accommodate your, your clients? It's yes and no. I mean, not frequently, but sometimes we do. I mean, London's probably the hardest guys we work with. Yeah. Um, but pretty much everywhere up until about Denmark, is easy because you know I've got a call tomorrow with a, a new guy in, in Copenhagen, and you know he wants the call at three forty five p.m. our time, mm. so he can do it before he goes to work. Yeah. Um, and the verse vice versa in New York, you know they want to do their calls after work, so they might say seven p.m. their time, which is nine a.m. our time. So the hours are actually quite easy to work around. Um, but even now and then you'll get one that says I can only do it at two p.m. in the afternoon in London. And in that case, yeah, you're getting up at some pretty weird hours to do some calls. And, you know, it's just a matter of having your office at home set up. So you can just, you know, I always joke, I actually, you know, put, have pajamas on and the, the shirt on top. And I actually joke with the client saying how I'm doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Clip on tie as well. Just to... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the giveaways, the teddy bears and stuff, my, my daughter's usually hanging around the background. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, all right. Well, that's um, oh, but actually, uh, that's the question I had. So you said you're bringing on an advisor in based in Singapore. Yep, he's a um, ex uh, Western Australian guy. Bit more of a technical point. How how is that in terms of licensing? Having someone based in Singapore. Very difficult. It's yeah. taken us probably six months to get to that point. Um, Maz, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, which is their ASIC. Um, have actually been very good to work with, you know, mm -hmm. better than ASIC. ASIC will tell you what you're doing wrong, not what you're doing right. Yeah. Whereas how this whole thing started was Jared and I had sort of been following each other from afar for the last two years and he'd bounce through all the, you know, sort of different, um, you know, offshore advisories and found a really good home with uh, global financial consultants who, you know, these guys are legitimate players. They're actually doing proper financial advice as opposed to product sales. Yeah. Um, he's ex Patterson's out of WA. So he understands the Australian system very, very well, but he wanted to get back into that. And Singapore is a very technical market. You, you can't even market into Singapore without having a Singapore license. Mm. So what it was, it was a matter of uh, buttoning up with someone who had a Singapore license and 
you know, now being cross licensed with uh, with ASIC as well. So Singapore's licenses are quite hard. I think it's about one hundred eighty thousand Sing dollars you need to get a Singapore license. Yeah. Okay. So it's a lot harder than to get an Australian license. So oh. I've certainly haven't got that money lying around, so I can't sort of flop that around. But um, yeah, it's a matter of working with partners and and you know everyone getting a cut of the deal and and making sure there's there's incentive for them to go out and get more business. Yeah. Um, so at the end of the day, we're not making a lot of money on Jared at all at the moment, but because he's got a scalable opportunity, um, you know, we're invested in him like he's invested in us. Yeah, yeah. So if anyone has got any questions about cross-licensing, go to Brett. He's done all the research is what you're telling us. Yeah. <laughs> Still trying to work out Dubai. Dubai is a difficult one. There's that many different ju- jurisdictions in Dubai. No one can give me a straight answer. So that's been going for about eight months now. Yeah, right. So that's that's the next plan is to have someone based in Dubai? Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, the, for us, uh, Dubai, 15,000 Aussies, um, no real advice being provided over there. We're doing advice from here and mm-hmm. combined with visits, but there's no better result than boots on the ground. Yeah. Now, that sounds good. The hardest thing with Dubai, there's this. I, I could talk for another you know, hour and a half, but... Uh, We've got people here watching uh, who, who don't have uh, half a day to spend with us. Um, so yep. I will, I, I'd love to hear more about your fees uh, and I'll pass it over to Ben uh, to yep. maybe ask some follow-up questions, questions from the audience. And guys, anyone who's watching, um, just type any questions uh, in the chat box uh, and Ben will hopefully get around to, to asking those questions. Over to you, Benny. Cool. Yep, great. Thanks, Phil. Um, interesting story, Brett. Uh, I suppose, yeah, I I had a few questions like Phil about how you go about now you've got your service set up and and demographic. If you don't mind sharing a bit about how you approach your pricing model um, with your clients and, you know, what the sort of thought process that went behind that as well. Yep. To me, I mean, a lot of people are shocked when I say this, but our SOAs are incredibly low and they expect because we specialise that they go high. But we've played with every single different version for the last five years of you know pricing things different ways and and just been monitoring those results. When when we we think we're definitely this client's coming on board and we have a higher so why they gone. Um, to us, we want to price it in a way that encourages everyone to come on board. So our our average SOA fee is between one and two thousand bucks. Okay. So it's not a lot at all. I mean, you know, it's amazing how when we get phone calls from expats that are back on holidays and, and they ring around and they're getting quotes of 7,000, 10,000, and then they hear 2,000 and their first reaction is, why is it so cheap? Um, but I think what we've been able to do is really embrace the technological side. You know, we can use uh, Advice OS for a lot of the heavy lifting for 80% of it. And then we go in and tailor that response. And, and virtually that's just deploying our intellectual property into that SOA. Yep. Okay. And so we do have paying you to say yeah. that. Sorry, Phil. How much is Naomi paying you to say that? Oh, Naomi's she, she, she <laughs> promised me free drinks last Friday night. I know I was still still waiting for them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then so so that's your your advice uh, for the, the the initial model. But then what do you do? You have different sort of service levels ongoing, and how does that work? And what's the you know, what do people get and what's the approach to pricing in that respect? For us, um, we're sort of lucky in the fact that we, I'd say probably 80% of our advice is limited advice. You know, our clients don't need cash flow advice. They've got cash. Uh, our clients don't need a lot of that other stuff. So we can actually limit our advice to either uh, setting up an IDPS, like investment account or advice on super. Um, every now and then what we do is if we're doing an SOA and we're doing one right now for a gentleman who's about to move to Turkey, we might also include in the SOA things like um, the new help debt payment regime that expats are going to fall under as of one July next year. So we'll give them, by the way, here's what your help debt is. Here's what your overseas income is. The ATO is going to ask for approximately this amount here. Um, you know, you need to start saving between now and, the, and one July next year to have that money aside ready to go. So that sort of side of it, we can get away and out of the way up front, um, encouraging people to get valuations if they've got investment properties they purchased before the 8th of May 2012. We can deploy that stuff up front in the SOA. Then in terms yeah. of the ongoing relationship, um, we work on a... 
And, and the reason we do that is basically because we actually manage the money in house. You know, my background is actually as a broker. So managing portfolios is something we enjoy doing, but yeah. also too, I think what it does is, and I was talking to Phil about it this week, it gives, you know, the client, I guess, peace of mind knowing that we can't pass the buck. If there's a bad call made, it's our bad call. We can't say, oh, that was platinum or that was Magellan or, you know, so we find that, we, and we, we actually serve our clients every year and we say, would you prefer a fee for service or a fee under management? And all of our clients come back to us and say, we want you to have skin in the game. We want you to pay, we want to pay you a percentage fee. Okay. So I think it, to me, it's a matter of going back and keep asking the clients those questions. You know, clients change their minds. You know, they always do. But, you know, every yeah. year uh, in October for us, we'll survey our clients and, um, you know, ask them all these hard questions. You know, how are we going? You know, do you like the way we charged? Can we do things better? Do we do things differently? Changing it up. Um, sometimes clients, they feel better because they've had that chance to have that vent. And, yeah. uh, you know, the, the clients like, yeah, people like the vent. Yeah. Okay. Great. Interesting. Um, I suppose one of the other things just from the, the conversation that you're having with Phil is that you mentioned about half of your business is coming via social media. Yep. Um, can you yeah give, give us a bit of insight to that and uh, what channels you're using, how you're using them, what the strategy has been, are you getting help and uh, yeah, what sort of the, uh, the process there? Um, in terms of channels, pretty much all of them. Uh, you know, in terms of putting out content, It'd be LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, um, Google Plus. But we also, from time to time, use WeChat. Um, you know, the bit of stuff there we're sort of playing around with because there's a lot of Aussie expats in Asia using WeChat, not just China. Um, yeah. But that's sort of a playing side of it. We're still playing with Snapchat, but now that Instagram stories have come out, we're sort of maybe changing the focus back again there. To us, it's a matter of just generating content and putting it out there. You know, not asking for a relationship just saying here's information here's information and then uh, I did a post about two weeks ago or three weeks ago just saying we need your help and can you go out there and if you're finding value out of this I'd really appreciate it if you could just like these comments or, or share these comments um, mm -hmm. and that was on Instagram that was on um, Facebook groups uh, Facebook groups to me is probably the the nugget out of for all of us in terms of areas that we can work on because it's amazing how minutely you can distill um, into Facebook groups. Um, you can probably, if you want to target engineers, it's probably in the engineers Facebook group you can jump on board. And it's just a matter of just joining the conversation. And, you know, every now and then you'll get one blowback. We had a guy out of the um, Australian expats in Cambodia group who, um, you know, came back to me and said, I should read a book on social marketing and I shouldn't be begging for followers. And, you know, I just, said, I just went back to him and said, look, for the last six months, I've been providing free content in this group about managing your super as an expat, where to accumulate your wealth as an expat. You know, I've done that almost every week for the last six months. And this is my one call to say, if you're finding this of value, please share it. Um, and he went away quickly. So yeah. that, it's funny how you've, you've got to be very careful in the, the language you use and, and how you phrase yeah. those responses. Mm -hmm. um, you can't sort of take a, an attacking view, but also too, you can't take a, a laissez-faire view. You've got to sort of stand your ground sometimes and say, look, we're very proud of what we're doing. Um, you know, off you go. Yeah. Hate is going to hate. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think that, that, that to me was always the first thing, you know, it, it, you know, no one's, you know, we, we work with um, Baz Gardner and the guys at social advisor uh, for many years. Um, yeah. But what we found was that was great but we had to make it our own on the expat side. It's a very different yeah. language. You know, yeah. in social media, they always talk about having running commentary and all these sort of things. Whereas expats, quite funny, they actually like to sort of live in the, in the shadows. So mm -hmm. what you'll find is you'll put a, put a piece out there and you'll get some likes and you think, oh, that didn't work. And next, next day you come in and there's 15 emails. You yeah. Know, because they, they want to, they want to, you know, talk in private on the side. So, that to me, measuring those sort of things is, is always the hardest thing, you know, in terms of how do your clients want to communicate? Don't try and shove them down one way. Work with how they want to work. Yeah, okay. And so is that the, the approach with, with these channels that you just 
sort of uh, trying to add value and put content out and then yep. people are approaching you for, for business more than you sort of trying to push through the social yep. media. Yeah. I mean, to me, the, the content always speaks loudest. You know, if the content's relevant and useful, they may not need me now, but they might need me in six months' time. And it's amazing yeah. how, you know, we're talking to a, to a couple in Beijing right now who I spoke to in 2014 and we had a bit of stuff in 2015 and they're only now coming on as a client. You know, expats yeah. are a very long tail. You know, yeah. we, 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 we don't have the privilege or the benefit of them coming into our office and sitting at our boardroom. So sometimes for them it takes longer to build up that rapport than, say, mm -hmm. someone coming in physically. But then we get blown away sometimes where we never meet the person either in Skype or in person and everything's on email and then become a client. And we're like, oh, should we organize a Skype call to introduce it? No, we're fine. We're fine. So yeah. different people have different engagement levels and, and it's a matter of just, I guess, just watching very closely and seeing what they want and not, not trying to push them in a direction that they may not you know, want to go in. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's good advice for anyone to deal with the clients on their terms. I know that that's something that we, we try to do in our business and I think you yeah, completely right there. Um, uh, what? Okay, one question just following up from uh, from Amy, just around uh, targeting your niche market. And uh, yep. congratulations to Amy, by the way, on launching her own business in the last sort of couple of weeks. Nice one. Um, probably a relevant question for Amy um, in terms of targeting your niche. And how did you do that and rebuild your business? So if you if someone's wanting to transition to a, a particular niche, perhaps away from an area that they've been focusing or maybe hadn't had an area of focus in the past. What are the, you know, can you give any tips as to the approach that they might be able to take and how they can do that effectively? Uh, immersion is probably the best way to describe it. I would say for a month, just put all of your energy, time and effort into researching that area. And I'm talking during work, go home, have dinner, and then back onto it to a two in the morning. Um, for virtually the first four years, you know, and even now to a certain degree, I'm still doing some pretty stupid hours. Um, you need to understand what the problem is in that area first before you can present a solution. So, you know, if you, if you go in blasting and, and, you know, sort of telling them what the problem is as opposed to listening what the problem is, no one's going to listen to you. Whereas, you know, all the LinkedIn posts that we do um, are usually providing an answer to a problem. So how do you structure your super as a US resident, for example? You know, that sort of stuff that, you know, people may not think is a problem until they read it. But we know that yeah. it is a problem because we often get asked those questions. So if you want to break into an area, I would say, you know, live in the shadows of that, of that area and just, just live, eat and breathe it for a month. And it's amazing how much information you'll pick up. Yeah, okay. Great. I think that's great advice. Um, I a couple of questions um, from Adrian. Firstly, a quick one. How many people have you got in your business? Um, we only got six, actually, believe it or not. So, you know, technology for us, in the past, we would have, you know, probably eight to 12 of what we're doing. But now yeah. that we're, we're cloud-based, you know, everything's on CRM. Um, we've systemized a lot of processes. Um, yeah. temp templating things is a very important way. So I can be out doing things. And if I wanted to send a standard email out to a client to say that their rollover has been received and we're going to start rebuilding their portfolio, you know, the girls in the office can do that for me without me even being here. So I think that's important to scale yourself. Um, we're getting to the point now where we're sort of, you know, I think we've got a bit more to go, but then we're going to put another person on. But for the time being, you know, um, you know, we've been operating pretty well at these levels. Yeah. Okay. Right. And out of those uh, six, a lot of them are part times too, and off site. Okay, interesting. And how do you, so? How do you manage that as with with your off site? Do you when you say off site, do you mean offshore or no? No, she just in Australia. So one of them is my uh, my sister in law. Um, she's got a little bub, but you know, I think recognizing people's strengths is a, an important part. And one thing that Harley does very very well is follow instructions. You know, she'll actually rewrite the process in her own mind. And then giving her non-time sensitive information uh, that has to be put up into the CRM or, you know, um, little things like we've got a process when we onboard clients or actually onboard inquiries. You know, the first thing we do is we put them into the CRM. We put them into MailChimp to our inquiry newsletter uh, list. And also, too, we put them into a program we call, use called Pipedrive, uh, which has been a great program for us. So, you know, 
that is stuff that you don't have to be a power planner or a CSA or an advisor to do. So, yeah. you know, and, and all she does is, you know, when the baby's gone to bed at 10 o'clock at night, you know, she goes through her emails and just puts all this stuff up there. So we come in the next morning and it's all there waiting to go. So, you know, I think uh, reaching out to your friends and family and, and colleagues, it's amazing how people want to do these sort of things, but they want to do it at their, that, that suits their schedule. And yeah. you can find this stuff out, get rid of the non, non core stuff from yourself and uh, you know, makes things a lot easier, but yeah, you, know, you need to be on a cloud based system. You need to be very systemized. You need to be very structured in order to get that same result every single time. Yep, absolutely. And that's probably a good lead into to the next question also from Adrian. Um, what, are the, what are the most useful pieces of tech that you've used, apart from giving you an opportunity to plug a bus OS another time, but um, <laughs> maybe outside of that, um, what, what are you know, the, yeah, the things that you found most useful? Um, to us, uh, Pipedrive is a great, program which doesn't cost a lot at all um, and that's a, a software as a service you can you know, sign up to it online it's a great way to track your, your leads now the problem is because our onboarding process is a lot longer than say an average advisors it's easier to lose track of where things are at so mm -hmm. you can you can set up it's just pipedrive.com I'm pretty sure it is um, and you can and it's like tiles so you know, all the inquiries are here, you drag them across to the next column, next column, and, and you can set these little features like rotting features. So after seven days, if there's been no activity on that client, it turns red, so you know to action it. So I'm a very visual person, as opposed yeah. to having a list of tasks, I like to have, you know, images, I guess you could say, because then you get that, so it's almost like a gamification, because at the end, you either drag it down to one or lost. So, um, you know, it's a great way to manage that. We combine that with a document called uh, a program called PandaDoc, P-A-N-D-A-D-O-C, and yeah. the other big problem that we have with our clients is getting them to sign documents. I mean, you think it's hard to have a domestic client to sign documents? Try getting someone yeah. in New York to do it. So, our personal profile and risk profiles are all done in digital form, and it actually syncs with an extension to PipeDrive. So, PipeDrive okay. almost becomes the pre-client CRM. Right. So all your records are tracked through there and then you can download that and, and upload it into your advice CRM once they become a client. But that is a very, you know, rather than saying, please print off this document, sign it, scan it, email back to me. To us, yeah. it sounds very simple. But to them, it's like, oh, I'll do it this weekend. The weekend comes, oh, I'll do it next weekend. We've had stuff go out to three and four weeks. Um, yeah. Whereas we can give them a link, they can type all their details in. It's a digital document with a digital signature. Um, IP addresses captured everything. But the other great thing about it too is you can put videos inside that document. So okay. from our point of view, you know, nine times out of 10 when someone approaches us, they don't know us from a bar of soap. So we put a video in, in that personal profile. This is a welcome to Atlas. This is who we are. This is what we do. Um, to try and to start building that engagement. And we're going to use more and more videos in that onboarding process just to try and bring them in, um, you know, and sort of combine them with that as well too. Okay. So those two there would be the, the, you know, more so the onboarding process. Um, yeah. In terms of client management, obviously Skype's a great one. Um, we're actually about to look at using Sweetbox. We just have to do okay. a bunch of test calls with clients in different countries to make sure that it works in different countries. Yeah. Um, we have some weird places that we talk to, Burundi, Laos, Mongolia. So we need to make sure that that actually works in that area. But to us, that's going to be the next thing it's going to kick our game up uh, with Sweetbox is the fact that it automatically integrates with Advice OS and yeah. all of our client conversations can be recorded and added as a file note. So that's going to save me a lot of time to say, yeah. oh, you had a call with Ben today. We discussed this, this, and this. You know, we agreed to do this, this, and this. Now it's going to be a matter of recording that. Um, and if you need to sign documents, we can bring those up into Sweetbox, uh, sign on the screen, capture that signature by a digital recording. Um, it takes things to a whole new level, but we just need to go through the IT side first to make sure it does work in those jurisdictions. Yeah, okay. Awesome. Um, cool, just got another question here from Peter, um, just in relation to compliance and in particular around uh, Australian and offshore licensing. Are you able to deal with experts in all countries? Um, can you use, you know, digital communications only and rely on that or do you need to visit them or do they need to visit you? It's 
it's like everything. It, there's no one standardized rule for every single country. And we're still learning as we go along. So like I said before, with Singapore, you can't even market into Singapore without having a Singapore license. They'll, they'll ping you for that. And I've seen that happen before with other, other guys and girls. Um, yeah. Most countries, you know, it's, they don't really care. The U S is a bit, bit, diff- bit different. U S you're okay to market into the U S or not market into the U S you, you're okay to generate content, which is seen in the U S but as soon as you put boots on the ground, um, and we're actually working through that problem right now with the SEC, you know, there are exemptions because what we want to do is run some seminars in the States, but the last thing we want to do is get caught up by the TSA at the airport and, you know, end up in a jail. So, you know, we mean going very slightly there. And from our point of view, we want to have a solution, but obviously working with the SEC, you reckon the ASIC's bad, you should try SEC. They're just, yeah. you know, as soon as they hear the word Australian super, you know, they just go cross-eyed and they just don't know what we're talking about. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Uh, okay, another one about uh, this is on the same sort of vein from Ray. Uh, if you if you if you're working as an advisor in Australia with an Australian AFSL, yep. what are the what are the options around overseas advice? Um, it, you know, are powers of attorney required? Uh, and you know, what? Yeah, if someone's looking at this, what are the what are the things that they should look out for? Depends on who the who the uh, provider is. You know, there's no standardized result. You know, um, some providers like BT, for example, anytime you do a IDPS account, they, they want a uh, uh, power of attorney for someone in Australia. And that's more for their compliance to say the control is in Australia and all that sort of stuff. Whereas in actual fact, you know, they're the first ones to admit that, you know, you still got to talk to the guy overseas. Um, you know, there's, I've heard very different reports, you know, as soon as you met, if you want to make it even more complex, as soon as you mention the word uh, Australia, Australian expat in the United States, um, a lot of them run for the hills because they don't want to do deal with what's called the FATCA reporting. So now there's all this reporting compliance that has to be sent back to the IRS. So the platform provider has to provide to the ATO any accounts that are owned by a US resident or a US citizen. So a lot yeah. of the platforms have said, we don't want to have to deal with that. So they actually blanket ban um, having US citizens or US um, residents as a client. Mm. So we actually find we use multiple platforms all depending on where the, uh, where the client's located. But, um, you know, usually it's quite simple to do. You just approach the platform and say, what are your requirements around X? Some, some platforms will say, we'll take clients from only five countries. Some, some will say we'll take clients from all these countries apart from these two. Um, there's no standardized, you know, uh, result from any platform, unfortunately. Okay. Great. So check in with the product providers. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay. Last question I've got here is from Amy. Um, it, just how, how many countries are you working with and, uh, are you, you so you obviously you're dealing with expats, but is there any more uh, sort of boundaries you put on the, the you know ages or demographics for for those particular clients? Not at all. We we're right now in eighteen countries, soon to be maybe twenty one or twenty two. We've got about uh, wow. twenty rollovers we're dealing with at the moment. So for us, you know, if you're twenty or seventy and you're an expat, you're a client. Yeah. Um, and I guess one of the things we've done is tried to price our model and also design our model to suit Australian expats. So we want people to self-select. You know, we don't want them people to deselect if that makes sense. So we don't want them to say, oh, I'm only 20, you know, what can be done here? A lot of expats, the day they graduate, they jump on a plane, they go overseas. So they won't have super. But what they'll do is they want to talk about strategies to either repatriate money back to Australia and start developing savings or help, help with their help dem- payments coming up. Um, up to retirees who, you know, we've got guys who may never come back to Australia. You know, I was talking to one client yesterday who's going to be retiring in Italy. Um, so we're talking about some complex issues there regarding can you get access to a part age pension as a non-resident, uh, combine that with their super. So I guess the older they get, the more complex their problems. But, um, you know, for us, if you're an expat and you're on planet Earth, then you're a client. Yep. Awesome. Great. Well, I think that's uh, that's pretty much the questions from the crowd. Um, thanks heaps for sharing with us. So I think there's some really good uh, takeaways there, um, some good tech tools, uh, and and some ideas for you know setting up your business in a way to scale. 
Uh, I think these days everyone's looking at niching, so I think people get a lot of value out of um, out of out of the the tips that you've given around that. So yeah, really appreciate that. No, thank you. I mean, and that's one of the things that probably I'm most passionate about now is helping people specialize because as an, as I, I sort of consider myself almost an outsider as a planner advisor because I've come in from the broking side. So I haven't sort of been indoctrinated for the last 19 years that I've been in the industry yeah. in that process. And my biggest worry for what I call the generalists um, is with the disruption coming through, they need to have a value proposition. And, and if it's like, I'm going to provide you financial planning, you know, I think you need to have more than that. So, um, you know, I've been helping a lot of guys go through that process and spitballing ideas and work out ways they can sort of improve it because that to me is what's going to take the advice industry to the next, you know, next level up is when we yeah. can start talking about specialising as opposed to just being a generalist across the board. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, thanks, Brett. And thanks everyone for jumping on board and watching. Uh, remember that we uh, put these videos up online on YouTube. So, um, feel free to go there and check it out if you've missed anything or if you had to jump away early or come late. Uh, and next week, we've got, or next fortnight, we've got some really exciting stuff happening. We've got an advisor from the US, um, so we, we're going international. Um, Kate Holmes, not Katie Holmes, unfortunately, but Kate Holmes uh, next fortnight. And there's other exciting stuff going on, so make sure you uh, keep in touch with, with what we're doing here at XY advisor uh, thanks again for brett for coming on board and sharing all your uh, knowledge around working with expats and niching and if anyone's got any questions how are we going to get in contact with you uh, for me probably the best way is uh obviously twitter i'm, I'm always going to embrace the social media side to the keep the discussion going because that way can, people can refer to it so um hashtag um at atlas wealth mgmt is my twitter uh username uh, email is brett.evans at atlaswealth.com.au um, but yeah usually hit me on Twitter and I can I can find you otherwise drop me on the email awesome thank you very much again Brett and thanks Ben for, for uh, being involved uh, so we'll see you guys all in a fortnight's time peace cool. out thanks Brett thanks guys